is my story. That's very short. <laughs> All right. Amanda Benjamin is a native North Carolinian, obtained her law degree with honors from the University of Tennessee's College of Law. And after graduation, she and her husband headed west and first established their home in Oregon in Medford, where she was in private practice. In 2015, they moved to Newport, where Amanda was associated with the, an attorney's group here. Her interest in children and the law led her to work with Lincoln County's Child Protective Services. She also established Lincoln County's Mental Health Treatment Court. She ran unsuccessfully a few years ago for an opening on the bench. And then <coughs> just this year in May, our governor, Kate Brown, appointed Amanda to fill out the then retiring Judge Branford's rest of his tenure. So now Judge Benjamin, we will call her from here on, will be uh, on the 2022 ballot uh, to re run for her position if she chooses to do so. And I think you said that would be in November, huh? In the May election. Okay. So we welcome Judge Amanda Benjamin to our gathering today. And I've asked her to give us a brief overview. We'll call it Courts 101, because <laughs> most of us don't know a whole lot about the openings and the positions on the court. And then she's going to talk about <coughs> to her trials and tribulations. Let's put, put it like a <laughs> finding good child care, just finding child care when we maybe went back to work after our kids were a little bit older. So she's going to talk about this in light of what's going on nationally, state wise locally and every other way. We all have something or someone we know about that struggles with this. So you may clear the air and uh, speak to us about this. Thank you. Um, so I have a quiet voice. Can everyone hear me at this level? Take is that better? Yes. Yeah, that is better. Okay. So I'm a circuit court judge. Um, basically, in Oregon, there are very generalized, but there are um, three main types of courts. There's a circuit court, which is the um, countywide court. Um, in Oregon, there's 36 counties, 27 circuit courts. So some smaller counties share a circuit court. Um, there's the uh, Court of Appeals, which um, for the most part, they serve to review the decisions of the circuit court. And then there's the su Supreme Court, which for the most part, serves to review the, um, the decisions of the appellate court. And there's various other smaller courts, tax courts, um, and um, um, smaller courts within cities, but that's the general court system in Oregon. Circuit courts hear just about everything you can imagine that happens on a county basis. So we hear um, custody cases, um, divorces, um, civil lawsuits, uh, criminal matters from traffic tickets to murder. Um, just about everything that you can imagine comes in front of a circuit court. Uh, in Lee County, we have three circuit court judges. Um, so we share, you know, we all have our, our specialties. One of the judges is um, um, kind of her specialty is the family law cases, so she takes the bulk of those. Another judge um, has um, um, most of the big criminal cases, so we all have our different areas that we specialize in. Uh, I do all of the juvenile cases, so if a kid is involved in the juvenile delinquency system, gets into trouble, or if um, DHS is involved in um, a family and DHS takes custody of a child, I hear all of those um, types of cases. So judges serve a uh, six-year term. Uh, most judges in Oregon tend to be appointed first, and that's because judges will typically um, retire sometime in the middle of their term, and then the governor will appoint a replacement. Uh, most of the time, those elections are contested, so a lot of times you'll just see a judge get appointed, they go to the ballot, they run uncontested, um, and a lot of 
judges will never have a contested election for their entire career. Uh, so a lot of the times we don't see that happen, but it does um, more often recently than, than in the past. Okay, courts 101. <laughs> um, any general questions about how the circuit court operates? Well, I just, I'd just like to uh, give you my opinion of uh, the ballot when it appears, because with rare exception, the judges, for whatever reason, do not think it's important to give the voting public information about themselves. And I frankly think it's an insult to the voting public. I want to know who the candidates are. Uh, there may not be any contention at all, but 10 years from now, when that judge is up for maybe the Supreme Court, I want to know a little bit of that history. And I, I feel very strongly that the judges kind of say, it's a done deal. Not, not you specifically, but it's just what I have seen and gotten upset about. Yeah, and I, that's fair. I think, um, I think there's a, kind of an old attitude about that, that judges typically aren't we typically don't run against the judge. Right. Um, you don't want to have that, uh, you, know, you lose, that doesn't put you in a very popular position as a practicing attorney. That's probably one of the reasons. Um, but a judge is also one of the only positions where it will tell the voters on the ballot if that person is an incumbent. Mm -hmm. So every other position, you just have right, three or four names and you have to read and do your research to choose who to pick. But the judges is the only position where you will see incumbent next to it and so a lot of times people just um, vote for who's already there and so maybe that's part of why they don't tell you as much um, about who they are and what their background is that's a good point um, also you know you have to be careful because it's a nonpartisan position so you really aren't allowed to associate with a political group or um, give too much information about what your political leanings are so they need to be being very careful not to get General background is what I'm looking for and not for, without additional research. Sure. So I came, um, Marilyn already told you a little bit about this, but I am from North Carolina. Um, I met my husband when I was in law school in Tennessee. Um, neither one of us had strong ties to where we were living. So we decided um, being the type of people we are, we did research into where would be the best place to live. And we looked at weather and taxes and um, employment and all of these different factors. And, and then we took a road trip and we visited all of these places and fell in love with the Oregon coast, uh, Bandon area and Newport. And we ended up getting married in Depot Bay. Um, and my first job, the day after I passed the bar exam, I got a job offer in Medford, so we went there first. And both started just applying to every job we could find on the coast and ended up here. So we both worked at the district attorney's office and um, bought a home in Newport. And then I, in 2017, had our first child. And so I'll start talking a little bit about, um, if there's no other questions about law practice or the courts, I'll start talking about how we got involved with um, or our, I guess, our experience with trying to find child care in Newport. Yeah. So um, everybody told me that I would have trouble finding child care. As soon as I became pregnant, they said, start looking for someplace, somebody to watch your child. And I listened, but I, I don't think I really understood what they were telling me. So I started looking, I was probably six months pregnant when I started looking for where I was going to, uh, who, who was going to watch my child. Um, called every single registered child care provider in the county, got my name on a list. I actually got my first call from one of those lists three months ago, and my child is four. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, no, I'm no longer interested, but I have another child and you can put her on the list. Um, so once, when my child was born, my son um, was born, we still didn't have childcare and um, we were kind of desperately searching. Um, there's a lot of websites, you probably, um, some, a lot of you probably know, there's a lot of websites that list for care providers, care.com, Manny Lane, there's these websites where you can go on and try to find um, child care providers. But 
what I found was either they were very experienced people that wanted $25 an hour, which mm -hmm. I couldn't afford, or they were looking for occasional babysitting, um, or they were very unqualified, um, not somebody you would trust with your um, child or you felt uncomfortable with or something like that, couldn't pass a background check. Um, so I quickly realized that I couldn't afford to go that route. Um, and what I ended up finding was another mom who um, had her own kids and was staying at home and agreed to watch my child. But what I didn't know at the time is she wasn't licensed for a child to run a child care practice. She was just working under the table kind of thing. And when it came time to um, do our taxes at the end of the year, I said, okay, what's your tax ID number? So I could <laughs> do my taxes and wouldn't provide it, um, wouldn't watch my child anymore. So there's, you know, there's, there's more to it, which is just paying somebody down the street to watch your child for, you know, so many dollars an hour. It was a much more difficult process. So at that point in time, we had to make a decision. Essentially, it was I going to stay home with the children or with my husband. And uh, my husband had many more years practicing law than I did. He was more confident in his ability to leave the job market and come back into it. Um, so he decided to stay home with our son. And um, I, at the time, I had tried, it had taken me so long to get the job that I wanted. I felt like I had, it was a tough job market, but I had applied probably every DA's office in the state. Um, I fought really hard to get the position I did, and I didn't want to step back and then have to re-enter after a couple of years. Um, so he made that sacrifice to stay home uh, with our son. And he eventually got a job in Albany, and we were able to find child care for our son in four battles. So he made <coughs> probably spent between three and four hours in the car with our son every single day. Um, but that was the sacrifice we made, and we wanted to stay here. And um, we thought, surely, after a couple of years, this side will find we'll find an appropriate child care. So my second child, my last child, was born in March of 2020, right as the pandemic was getting started, which actually worked out perfect for us because my husband was furloughed the same month my daughter was born. So he had, you know, forced, um, forced into the stay-at-home dad role again uh, while we started to look for, it, for somebody to watch the kids. And when, um, after a few months when he was ready to get back to work, we were suddenly in a very a much more fortunate position. I had um, gotten the appointment. We had the income to pay someone to watch our child full time, which we had before. Uh, and I, we bought a new house here in Newport with lots of space, and I decided, okay, here, is my opportunity. I know at least five other moms in my exact same position with little kids that are either going to have to quit their job or um, basically pay what they're paying their daycare provider in order to continue working. So I said, we have the room, we have the space, let's use our house and start uh, in home child care um, center. And so that's where I really learned after two kids um, and all of these years of trying to find someone, that's where I really learned what the problem was with our child care system, was when I tried to start a center to provide child care. So in, um, well, I'll ask you a few questions. I don't know how many people are really familiar with um, the child care rules in Oregon. Are any of you? Yeah? Okay, so you guys know. Um, don't spoil it for the rest of them. <laughs> and so I'll, before I get into the rules about child care, I'm not an expert. Um, so don't rely on any information I give you. I'll give you um, a warning at the beginning. But this was what I learned from um, my studies. So can I, as a mom of two, nanny share with another mom with two kids? That being licensed through the state. No. So, uh, cannot. If you have three or more children, you have to be a licensed child care provider. Including your own? No. So, not including your own, but two children from different families, not your own. Right. 
can I watch my two kids or my um, five kids and somebody else's two children without being molested? Yes. Yes, you can. So if I have however many children are in my family, I can add two to that without having to be licensed. Can I employ my 17 year old niece to watch my children without her having to be licensed? No. I can employ my mother, a, a parent, a sibling or an aunt or uncle are the only family members that can watch child and license. Does an in-home nanny or child care provider need a food handler's card? Yes. If I have chickens, if I have a farm with chickens, or my husband is a fisherman, can I feed my kids that I watch those eggs or fish? No. Definitely not. Uh, everything that you provide to the children in your care has to be from a commercial supplier, unless it's vegetables. You can feed them uh, home grown vegetables. Do I have to pay a child care provider overtime? Yes. Time and a half. Can I use potty chairs when I'm potty training a child that I'm caring for? Not unless I have written approval from the department. <laughs> From the department. No. From, or the parent or the department. From the department. Can I, for lunch, order the kids in my care a pizza and I'll sit down and eat that pizza? No, no family style meals at all. They have to be individually um, planned for the child with a food for each food group. And I have to make records of everything I serve those children throughout the day, every snack. Every meal, every part of it. What is the max penalty for violating one of these rules? Yeah. Fifteen hundred dollars a day. Oh my goodness! And who we, who would charge? Who would be charged for that? The daycare provider that's violating the rules. So welcome to certified child care. <laughs> When I started this out, I thought, okay, yes, it's a lot of, it's a lot of rules, it's a lot of note taking, a lot of hoops to jump through, but it's possible, right? It has to be possible. So there's two types of home-based child care licenses. The first one is called um, registered child care, and you can have up to ten children in the home. But my goal was to fill this gap of infant care because. It's hard to find care for a three-year-old, but it's not as hard, it's out there. So my goal was uh, 24 months and under is the gap that nobody can uh, find. So I can't do that easier, easier um, license to certify with the register. So then we go to the certified child care uh, rules. And with certified, you can have up to 16 children, uh, but you can only have four under 24 months. So it's a one to four ratio, one care provider for four and but okay, well that's possible, um, especially if I provided had two care providers and paid them both and had six to eight kids. So then comes all the extra requirements. So if you have a, a provider, they have to be 18 years old. They have to have some combination of experience or education. So either they have um, teaching experience, at least one year of actually teaching in that environment uh, on their own, or they have to have 20 semester credits of early childhood education. So then they have to have a first aid certificate, a food handler card, child abuse training, sleep, sleep abuse training, and ongoing requirements. If you have somebody that meets those requirements, they're most likely going to want more than $13 an hour, <laughs> which is your minimum wage that you have to pay them. Um, I think Taco Bell right now is paying 20 So if you can find somebody that will do this on $13 an hour, and you have to pay them, let's say if you, you want to be open from 8 to 5, and then you count in 30 minutes at the beginning and 30 minutes in the, uh, at the end for paperwork, cleaning, um, pick 
making up. So you pay them $10 a day or 10 hours a day, then you're assuming. <laughs> that's 50 hours a week so you're paying six hours of overtime at time and a half you're paying that 13 hour uh, employee see about three thousand dollars a month so each if you had four infants being watched each of those parents would have to pay 760 dollars a month that's just to pay the employee that's not for the food, the diapers, the electric bill, all of these rules that you're applying, that's just salary. If you're paying somebody $20 an hour, which is a more reasonable rate for what they're doing, then you're looking at each parent paying approximately $1,200 a month just to cover salary, the bare minimum. Then you have the overhead, you have to pay 10% for employment taxes, um, so you're looking at a, a wage gap um, where the parents who would be able to provide that level of care for their children can hire a private nanny, right? So the, the benefit isn't there to start that type of child care service. So what actually um, didn't necessarily put me off um, obviously, I was surprised to learn all of this, but actually what the deciding factor for me was in not going forward was, was my house didn't qualify. So you cannot have children in a child care setting on a second floor. If you watch children, it has to be on a floor with two usable fire exits. So if you have one stairway and on a second floor, you cannot have a child care center. You also can't have it in the basement, same reason. You can't have children on a floor where there isn't a bathtub. In my home, it doesn't have a bathtub on the second floor. So there's all these things that make uh, a certain type of residence completely uh, off the, out of consideration. So not only do you have to have a person who um, has the means to provide um, this type of, of center, but they have to be able to afford a certain type of home to run a child care center. So, um, not a very positive talk, but what I found when I did this research is nobody's talking about this problem. You know, I read all of these articles about there's no child care and there's nobody to watch infants, but nobody's talking about, you know, the hundred pages of rules that make it completely impossible for somebody to start an infant child care business. So that's what um, I wanted to get some insight <coughs> into was what some of the, the really um, what are the factors are that really discourage people from starting this type of business? Yeah. The state makes these rules, right? I'm sorry. The state makes these rules. Yes. Are they that careful with uh, placing foster kids? No. <laughs> um, no. There. Um, I shouldn't say that so um, carelessly, but there are less rules for placing foster children than these require. Uh, certainly a lot less safety rules. So when I, I was certified to have foster children um, a few years ago, and they do a walkthrough of your house, and there are a lot of crazy rules. You can't have, um, there's a lot of things you can't have, a lot of locks and safety measures that you have to put in place for a foster child, but nowhere near what this is. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, why? That's a good question. I mean, I think so. If you look at each individual rule, is there a reason for it? Sure, right? You, you want to have a bathtub for the kids, so if they need a bath, you're not washing them in the sink with the dishes. That's a reasonable rule. But to fix that, you're making every single child care center have to have a a bathtub on the, in the same space as they're watching children, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think if you take every single rule out, um, that in and of itself makes sense. Another thing that made my house not qualify, you have to have a yard with uh, so many square feet per child that you're watching, an outdoor yard. And it has to be surrounded by a fence that's so tall with so many inches of gap between the very specific rules. 
and my house doesn't have a yard. So I called the um, department and I said, okay, can I get an exception? I don't have a yard in my house. I have this giant indoor play area. I have play equipment, it's just like outdoors. I don't have a yard. Uh, and they said, well, then you have to have an adjacent property agree to let you use their yard at all times. <laughs> That's the only exception. So, yeah. Um, these same rules apply to co-op situations where money's not actually exchanged in exchange? Any type of, yes. So several mothers or parents get together and they agree to watch each other's kids. Yes. There is an exception if you have, if parents stay there. So if parents are engaging in some sort of group or activity and their kids are on the same property, that, that's an exception. Um, but if a parent leaves and somebody else is caring for multiple children, singles. So they just expect people to stop working. That's essentially, I mean, that's, that's the end goal. I just lost my judicial assistant last week who has been working since she, full time since she was 15 years old. And she had her second kid looked for almost a year since she was pregnant, since she got pregnant, she started looking for child care, was never able to find anyone. She found one really wonderful woman, really well qualified, and um, got down to the paperwork and to do the taxes. And she said, "Oh, I can't, I can't accept pay. I'll lose my benefits," and backed out. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the flip side of this issue? What about companies and <coughs> businesses who want to offer their employees childcare? To make it easier to get into these, because it's meeting their need and washing up. Uh, Whether that would be an exception? Well, is it? Does it exist? Are you familiar with it? Is it filling the gap? Well, Don't the companies still have to abide by the they same rules? They still have to abide by the rules. I know, I mean, it, it probably, probably, it may be easier for a company to do it because they can absorb that overhead cost that a product is so that may make it easier, but they would still have to follow the same rules. Yeah. Welcome to my little point two two. <laughs> um, <clears throat> two things came up. I was part of a group that worked really hard to try to get the care center building. Our old YMCA for a while ran child care by the high school. That met all of the requirements. Um, and I think at the time they were charging three dollars an hour, and it was subsidized. But a lot of people still could not afford that. And so one of the things we attempted was at the Marine Science Center they were building some new buildings, and the space for a child care center is actually quite simple if you know the rules when you're building it. And so we attempted to lobby the powers that be and said, how about this space on the first floor and we make this uh, you know, a community daycare center? Well, the people that we were speaking to, you no know, offense to some of the gentlemen in here, but they were all like over 70 men and they just didn't get it. <coughs> they didn't they really care. The other thing we found was if we wanted to start a center, we could get grant money for equipment and we could get grant money for the space, even, but we could never get grant money for salaries. And we wanted to be able to reach the working people, and that we could never get past that. And so we're still talking about this, you know, 25 years. <laughs> I think we somehow we have to come up with some sort of centralized solution. I know of three other people recently in my neighborhood who took lost good jobs that they have been job care. We have to make a decision in our community. And then it's going to have to be subsidized. And they can't run. So, you see with the black bed or whatever that there's attempts to provide. For people who are using child care or using <laughs> child care. But there's the argument 
that I can apply to make this. Really, this is a supply side problem. And if you just put in, provide the subsidies to one of the parents, mothers, you're driving the demand higher to something that is really a supply, mm -hmm. supply side problem, and you're going to get more inflation. Well, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, are other states as bad as Oregon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> states I've been in have been. Yeah. I know my friends in Washington are struggling. My friends in California are struggling to find daycare. People I know in North Dakota are having trouble. In North Dakota, there's hardly anybody there. <laughs> <laughs> the difficult part is these rules are all in place to make it safe for a healthier place for the kids. And what it really encourages is everybody violating the rules and doing everything right. the wrong way. And then you don't have any uh, safety measures in place. Yeah. There's, there's another regulation which surprised a lot of people this year. And it's, I don't know when exactly it came into being, but again, it's well-intentioned. And it, it says that every new child care center whether you know a commercial one or in a home must have overhead sprinklers. I heard this about is, that. This is new. Oh. And you know, it's kind of an offshoot uh, because it's now required in new apartment buildings. And it is in our great big fourplex that serve you in the north part of town. All those apartments have overhead sprinklers in it. So it kind of trickled down to the anywhere children are. So they include a child care. And we talked to Representative Gomberg and Senator Anderson about it, and you know, the wheels grind slowly, but it's just onerous, well meaning, but unintentional consequences. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. It blows my mind how anyone would expect somebody starting out a child care business to buy all of this. Mm -hmm. you know, the uh, woman that watches uh, my children now is wonderful. Uh, and I can't even, I wouldn't even know where to tell her to start if this is her dream, to, which it is, to open a child care center. I don't even know how she could ever go about it. How would she get the funding? How would she buy a home um, in this area that would comply with all of it? You know, I think there's, there's one way we could solve the uh, newborn care problem for anyone who wanted to is to have pay leave after childbirth for a year. Wouldn't that be the solution for some people? Not everybody wants to leave after right. having a kid. They want to go back to work. Right. I mean, for some people. Yeah. Work. I know after after my second child, I wanted to go back to work so bad. I was going <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back. <laughs> you haven't mentioned another potential burden and I'm sure once I mentioned it, you'll have an answer. But that's liability insurance. Uh, it, it must, is that, does that rear its ugly head on your list of things? That you know, I didn't make it that far. <laughs> <laughs> that is an answer I don't have. I will guarantee you. If you make it that far, the insurance isn't that bad. It, you, it adds on to your homeowner insurance, but it, it's, it's a mean cost if you make it that far. One, I noticed that the community college has a plus this water, whatever, and um, on, so you want to have a child care center. So supposedly they probably um, deal with a lot of this paperwork. I was really amazed at the write up of it because it seemed to have a Disclaimer at the end. Are you sure you want to do this if you really want to? <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. I, I met with the, um, I, don't, I can't remember his title, he's correct. Dave Price. Dave Price. Probably yeah. that runs that program. Yeah. yeah. Really wonderful. Um, and he's been wanting a child care center here forever and just can't get it done. I hope hopefully that will be successful one day down the road. That's a main source of absenteeism. Uh, people taking classes at the college. Yeah. Big time. 
started talking with a friend in Virginia and Italy not long ago, and she said, well, I told her what the topic was of our meeting, and we'd already had two people very qualified to discuss child care earlier in the year, and everyone was interested. And she said, well, you know, all the high schools have child care right on campus for our young mother high school. Mm -hmm. High school, because My daughter the, in the, high the school. teacher administration wants no, those two girls to finish school that is one way that they can bring the baby with them. My daughter worked with them for the day. Um, and that's those are valuable spots when they have an opening, people are five That's right, but how do they get around all the rest of this somehow? I think they have someone who's qualified to be a provider who runs the program and supervises um, the girls that work in the program. Now, I'm unfamiliar with the Lincoln County. Yes, yes. I think mean, I can answer that. My daughter, my youngest child, worked in the health program at Walport High, and she worked in the part of it that has the child care. And now she is in Oregon Coast Community College's child care program, and she's going to be working at the Celeste child care program with the infants. So she's in all of that, and she would love to start a child care facility somewhere but is running into all the exact same problems and knows that there are too many barriers in the way to even get a building, a facility put in place here. So she just wants to work in the child care facility and select for them. Are they reopening? They are. They, they are looking forward to it. She's on the list and she's doing her classes right now online. So she's really excited for that reopening. Very dire picture. I know. Do you have anything solution wise or? I wish I did. Um, but I, you know, two families can combine, you know, you have three or less children, um, split kids up, I guess, into separate places to, to get around the regulations. Um, but Hard as I found, there's just no there's no workaround for all the rules. There, you can get an exception for one little thing here, one little thing there. But um, I know I wish I had some board on not own child care, but is that employers should be providing uh, employer over a certain size, certain number of employees. Now, a lot of them that employ a lot of women do provide child care, like especially hospitals that have want to have nurses. But we need places there. like McDonald's to be right. right. And then there's the question of those who are not the big employers paying something towards a community provided, a uh, local public child care. Yeah. <laughs> They, they couldn't provide one themselves. Now that's not our solutions, but one we might want to consider. It turns out that the <coughs> state legal living voters does have a study on at this time, an update of a two-year study. And uh, as part of it, they're going to ask the local leagues to get some data to gather local data so that we can speak based on facts to the need. We all know the need, but we haven't gotten all the data together. And that's part of the uh, coming up with solutions is to show that you really have a problem that needs a solution. Yeah, that's, that was my point too. This is a business driven problem, really. Mm -hmm. It's it, because the problem was oh, somebody wants to work, they needed somebody to have to take care of their child. So, reverse the thought process. I'm with Ruth here. This is a business driven problem. And the problem that, just like she's explaining, has to do with well, what a small business do versus a large business versus a hospital. You know, all those are different forms of business, but there are potential answers. I, when I listen to you and I listen to the problem, I see that as the solution. It's a business-driven problem. 
Does anybody know, was it even um, suggested when they were rebuilding the hospital? Did it even come up? Uh, yes, it did. It did. I brought it up to several people. Mm -hmm. And the response from Newport Samaritan was, we're not in the child care business. Oh, oh. Well, neither is Chinook Wind Casino. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. uh, although they do have a child care uh, right next to the North Lincoln Hospital, which they've had for quite a while. It's been very successful. The hospital does subsidize it up there, but they were totally not interested here in doing anything with it. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe, they were maybe, short sighted. Yeah, maybe yeah. we just need to make it so that any new large building that occurs in the city and the county, that somehow childcare uh, center yeah. has to be taken into an account. And, and yeah, and if and if they don't, they could pay into a child care pot of some sort. Mm -hmm. that, that's been brought up too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we have community centers and we, we have centers for our, our elderly people to go and do stuff. Why don't we have a community child care center with trained and qualified people there where people can take their children? Why, why aren't we doing something like that and making it something we all contribute to? You can see that you get good Well, answer. and there's a lot of people with a lot more experience in it than me, but um, that wasn't my perspective of saying, oh, I can I can solve a problem. I can jump through the hoops. We can yeah. do this. And then finding out. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can light a fire under your community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this can certainly be something to build on. As any of you who like to be on this committee for our league to be reporting to the state by May when they want to report, would be more than welcome. I've spoken to this here too, but. We thank you so much for opening up. Something here, I think, for Amanda as well. So then you have your morning call. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate your time and effort and thought given to this subject. So, um, whether she could stay here or just here, or take it tonight. <laughs> Whatever, but anyway, go ahead with the last part of the meeting. I promise 20 minutes, hopefully, if every presenter, like our LP team, take one minute or two to say, Yes, that's my 